Um, I'm delighted that you've, you're doing this series on, on Revelation. I think it's a much uh, neglected book uh, in the Brotherhood, and I think it's great that you're, you're tackling it in the way that you are. And um, this afternoon, uh, we hope to spend a profitable time looking at these great uh, earthquakes that we have in, uh, in the book of Revelation. I wanted to start by just thinking in general terms about earthquakes. What are they about? And behind me um, there's a little video uh, montage, if we can get it working, of uh, some earthquakes. It comes up. So these are some relatively minor uh, earthquakes. And an earthquake occurs when we have a, a sudden release of energy from under the earth. Uh, and the point at which the energy is released is known as the, the epicentre. And then shock waves come out of the epicentre. They, they decrease in power, sometimes called seismic waves, as they travel away. Uh, and the measurement of the power of an earthquake, you'll probably be familiar with this, it's known as the, as the Richter uh, scale. Uh, it's an exponential scale, so um, a magnitude 7 earthquake is 10 times greater than magnitude 6, with, with 10 being the greatest. And the, um, the most powerful earthquake that's been recorded by man uh, was in Chile in 1960, 9.5 uh, 9 on, the, on the Richter scale. But as you'd have seen from that little video clip, some of the effects of an earthquake are, are truly catastrophic. Buildings are destroyed, uh, we can have tidal waves forming in, and, uh, with tsunamis, uh, often fires are created, loss of water, and sadly, very often, uh, loss of life. And there are a number of incidents recorded in the scriptures that are to do with earthquakes, and, and here are a selection of them from the, from the Old Testament. We can think about the events of the flood, when we're told that the fountains of the great deep were, were broken up, so there would have been some earthquake effects at the, at the flood. Uh, we can think of Sodom and Gomorrah and its destruction. I know that it's perhaps more inferring volcanic uh, activity, but again, there would have been some earthquakes uh, at that time. We can think of um, Korah, Dathan and Byron when the earth opened up and, and swallowed them because of their rebellion against uh, Moses. We can think of Jericho when uh, the walls fell down flat and, and Joshua led the people into the promised land. Remember Elijah. Um, Elijah was, um, felt the, the, the commandments, the power of God, and God wasn't in the earthquake or the wind or the fire, but in the still, small voice. We can think of Sinai, when the, when the earth shook, when Moses received the Ten Commandments, and there was a, a great earthquake, which we'll perhaps comment on in our, in our last address, uh, in the time of Isaiah. Now, if we were to want to bring out the, the main themes surrounding these uh, earthquakes, it's to do with God's judgments, I would suggest, and particularly on, on false worship or a false way of life. And it's also to do with a change in administration, a change in the order of things, of bringing in God's ways, replacing man's ways. Now, when we go to the, to the New Testament, um, the focus of earthquakes is, is primarily surrounding the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll remember that there was an earthquake at the death of the Lord Jesus, and the centurion uh, witnessed that. And then we're told that there was a great earthquake at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And when we stop and think about that for a moment, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest event that this world has seen to date. Because the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus heralds a new way, doesn't it? It heralded the, the end of the Mosaic uh, covenant, the veil of the temple was rent in two, and Jesus overcame sin and death. Uh, and we know that without this event, that our faith is, is vain. It's the very foundation block of our faith. Uh, and perhaps in a, in a similar pattern, we also have the, um, the earthquake that occurred in Philippi when um, the, uh, the, the disciples, the followers, were, were in the jail and the great earthquake opened the, uh, the prison doors. And perhaps that's following the same pattern, the opening of the prison house to those that... Uh, bound in, in death, as it were, giving way to, to new life to the followers of the Lord Jesus. And there's perhaps one other in the New Testament that we'll, we'll comment on uh, a little later. But we're here to think about earthquakes 
in the book of uh, Revelation. Now, I know you'll be familiar with the structure of the book of uh, Revelation, and uh, I was really pleased to see that you've got a nice coloured in uh, version of the, um, the structure of uh, the book of Revelation. It starts, of course, with the seven uh, letters, uh, then we move into the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven vials, and then finally the seven uh, thunders. And it's interesting to note the point at which the great earthquakes occur in the book of Revelation. The first one occurs at the end of the seals. It occurs in the sixth seal. We then have one in the um, second woe, or the, uh, the sixth uh, trumpet. And then finally, there's one in the seventh vial. And we're going to be concentrating on those three um, this afternoon. We're not going to be looking at the other minor earthquake that's, uh, that's recorded. Uh, we can talk about that separately if, if anybody would like to. But a way to note that after the earthquakes, uh, we then have a, a vision of the kingdom. Okay? So we've displayed uh, the book of Revelation as a, as a telescope there, because if we were to squash it all down, all the earthquakes would be aligned, and then immediately follows our visions of the kingdom. And, and I think that comes out in your, in your bookmark uh, that you have as well. Now, we know the book of Revelation is a book of sign and symbol. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ that he sent and signified it by his angels. So, should these earthquakes be thought about as something that is literal, or should we be looking at something that it is symbolic? Well, let's go to the Old Testament, to Isaiah chapter 13, because the key to understanding the book of Revelation is, of course, the rest of the scriptures. That provides us with the key to unlocking this book. And in relation to earthquakes, I think Isaiah 13 is very helpful in our understanding of what these, um, what these earthquakes represent. Because in Isaiah chapter 13, we have a prophecy about Babylon. That's made very clear in verse 1. It's the burden of Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. And this chapter is actually talking about the destruction of Babylon. If you come down to verse 6, it says, How ye... For the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. And we know how Babylon was destroyed um, when the Medes and the Persians came against Babylon and and took uh, the city. But I want you to note the language that's used here in this prophecy. If you come down to verse 13 of this uh, chapter, it says, Therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts in the day of his fierce anger. Now, this isn't talking about a literal earthquake. It's talking about a political uh, earthquake. It's the destruction, the passing over of power from the Babylonians to the Medes and the Persians. So we have the, the heavens being referred to here. The heavens are the political rulers, those that, that, that dwell in the heavens, the political heavens. They are shaken. And then we have the earth. Um, The earth are those that are ruled over. Uh, So it's the the people. So when we think of an earthquake, an earthquake in symbolic language is literally a shaking of people. It's a change in the institutions of things, a moving over from one order to the next. We get similar uh, language in verse 10 of Isaiah 13 where it says for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light the sun shall be darkened in his going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine now again are we talking about something that's literal here or something that's symbolic well I would suggest it's symbolic the stars would refer to the the rulers Um, the sun we might say well that's the the king Uh, the moon is the reflective power of the sun so perhaps representative of a religious order that is to be darkened and changed. If we had the time, we'd go back and look at uh, Joseph's dream, wouldn't we? At the sun, moon and stars uh, paying obeisance to him, speaking of his father, mother and brethren bowing down to him. So earthquakes then are not necessarily literal, um, but certainly in the book of Revelation are symbolic and it's language that's still used today if you remember back to 
the day of the Brexit vote, uh, two years ago, uh, commentators, when they heard the result in the morning, they called it a great political earthquake. In fact, earlier this week, when Boris Johnson uh, resigned, um, I was listening to the events on Five Live, and the commentator called it a seismic day in uh, Westminster. So this is something that we are very familiar with, this idea of an earthquake being symbolic of a change in power, a change in rulership. Okay, so let's go to um, Revelation chapter 6, where we read about the first of the great earthquakes. And let's see how the picture builds up uh, for us. I'm sure in your studies elsewhere you'd have thought about the seals of uh, Revelation uh, chapter 6. They start from when John uh, received this vision in, in AD 96. And the seals, as a reminder to you, are different phases of what happened to the old pagan Roman Empire. So the first seal starts with a white horse, this period of peace that uh, went throughout the Roman Empire from AD 96 to AD 183. That was followed by a red horse, um, which was a period of civil war in the empire. And it goes through the various phases till we get to the fifth seal. Let's have a read of it. Um, Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And and there's a cry as to how long this persecution is going to last. Now this cry from the souls under the altar, this is talking about the Christian believers that suffered greatly under the persecutions of Emperor Diocletian. So we're in AD 303 to 311. And what we need to remember is that up until this point, the Roman Empire was pagan. It worshipped a multiplicity of gods. It was extremely superstitious. It was filled with all sorts of odd uh, rituals. And what's interesting about this is that non-observance of the religion of Rome, i.e. paganism, was tantamount to treason to the empire itself. So you, you had to follow the, um, the, the religion, this paganism of uh, Rome. So let's then go into um, the, uh, the seal that we're to consider, the sixth seal in uh, verse 12. So let's read it again. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. So what is this talking about? Well, you'll note that it's very similar language to what we read about Babylon in Isaiah 13. And it starts with this great earthquake. So what's this great earthquake all about. Well, after the death of uh, Diocletian, this emperor that afflicted the Christian believers so greatly under the fifth seal, four Roman emperors uh, controlled the the empire. We had Licinius, Maximian, Maxentius and Constantius. And as we say, it was a pagan uh, empire at this time. Now, Constantius, he ruled in the rest, and he actually had rulership of of Britain. Uh, And he married a lady called Helena, and uh, they had a son uh, called Constantine. And it was on Constantius' death that Constantine ruled over his father's part of the empire. Now, Constantine was very ambitious, and having consolidated his power in the West. He had aspirations to take the whole of the Roman Empire and in particular he had aspirations on Rome itself. And what, Const- um, what Constantine did was that he formed this army, he took this army south and he went against Rome and he went against the Emperor of Rome, a man called Maxentius. And Maxentius and his armies met Constantine at a very famous place, uh, they met at um, the Milvian Bridge, which is just outside 
of Rome on the 28th of October, 312 AD. Now, Constantine had always carried its thought, uh, Christian sympathies. He himself was a pagan, but it's thought that his mother, Helena, uh, was a Christian. And Constantine certainly recognised the growing influence of Christianity and how many in high places had secretly converted to Christianity. And according to legend, before this great battle, Constantine saw a vision of the cross in the sky. And he saw this as an omen and he encouraged all of his men to put on their armaments the sign of the cross. Now, the picture that we've got on the screen there is a very famous painting of this battle. Uh, It hangs in the Vatican. And here we can see uh, Constantine uh, with his vision uh, of the cross coming up against Maxinius, who had as his symbol the dragon. And how that is, that the dragon in the book of Revelation, of course, is uh, symbolised as Rome, which today is manifest as the power of Russia. It was at this battle that Constantine won, that he overcame Maxinius, uh, and he took the Roman capital, and then after a period of years, by AD 324, he uh, consolidated the empire, and he was the sole emperor of Rome. So this was this great political earthquake that happened. Let's have a look at verse uh, 13 of Revelation chapter 6, because we read, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely fix when she is taken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll that is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now we said when we went to Isaiah that the heavens here represent the political rulers Uh, And the political rulers are rolled away as a scroll. Keep a marker in Revelation and let's go back to Isaiah 34. Because again we have this same language used in Isaiah. uh, This time of a different nation that judgments were going to come upon. Uh, It's the nation of Edom. Uh, Isaiah 34 verse 4 and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine tree and as a falling fig from the fig tree so you can see the quote here um, that's picked up in revelation in isaiah talking about the rulers of edom being moved out of the way and here in the great earthquake this great change when constantine took power And we shouldn't underestimate how massive a change this was. See, look what had to happen to the previous rulers of the Roman Empire. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 6 and verse uh, 15, where we read, And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now I want you to imagine if you were a Roman ruler, if you were in the Roman government or whatever it might be, and you had followed paganism all your life. And then along comes this man Constantine and he changes that. It took a period of years. But eventually Constantine established Christianity as the new state religion of Rome. So everything you'd accepted, everything you'd been familiar with, all of a sudden was to change and to be very different. And and we shouldn't underestimate how great a change that was. For centuries the citizens of Rome were forced to follow the pagan gods and their rituals. And now this new state religion that of Christianity caused them to accept the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptised into his name. So the pagans then, they had to flee away. They had to hide themselves. The persecutions were reversed, as it were. So only a few years earlier, Diocletian had caused great persecution on the Christian believers, but now the Christians had the upper hand through the work of Constantine. 
And so at the end of verse 16, where they, it says that they had to flee from the face of, uh, sorry, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Well, who was it that sat on the throne? Well, the one that sat on the throne was Constantine. And all these things have been brought to pass through the work of the angels, through the direction of the Lamb, through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's similar to what we have in Daniel chapter 9, where it's described of the, uh, the, the armies of the people of the prince that were to come against Jerusalem, which was the Roman armies in AD 70. And the prince was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in control of these things. And so in verse 17, for the great day of his wrath is come and who is able to stand? So against all the odds and with a great earthquake, the Roman Empire became Christian uh, and Constantine was established as the supreme leader. But of course, this isn't true Christianity, See, as we said earlier, Constantine had spent most of his life as a pagan. He was only baptised on his deathbed. And what Constantine was overall was a very clever politician as well as a, a military man. He was prepared to make compromises. Now in AD 325, um, Constantine um, called the first council of churches um, across uh, the then known world. So um, up until this point, the Christian church had various schisms within it based on wrong doctrine that had crept in. And at this Council of Nicaea, 1,800 bishops got together. It was administered, presided over by Constantine himself to try and sort out some of the divisions that were in the church. And one of those divisions arose between the Arians and those that followed Bishop Alexander. Now, Alexander professed the divinity of Christ as God, whereas the Arians are more towards the truth, shall we say. They focused on the supremacy of God. They said that Christ had a beginning and an end and that God was greater than uh, Christ. Now, they debated this long and hard over many, many months, and eventually Constantine was able to produce from this council a very cleverly worded statement, which they were all able to agree on, and it said this. It said that we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God, of very God begotten, not made being of one substance with uh, the Father. Now we can see in that statement the, uh, the very clear roots here of the doctrine of the Trinity and the establishment of the false church. And we know over time that the church has just gone farther and farther away from the true scriptures. And so the events here that happen with Constantine, they are a challenge and a warning to us not to be deceived by the spirit of compromise and ecumenically joining with others to the detriment of the truth and this is a great theme isn't it that builds uh, throughout this book of revelation the development of the apostate church started here um, with constantine so the sixth seal then the first of the great earthquakes it's that change from paganism to christianity the establishment of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. And that church was going to dominate uh, Europe uh, throughout uh, the Middle Ages. 